Hi, I'm Matt Russell at the University of Minnesota. I'm going to talk to you about ethics and research and some things you'll need to know. First, we'll chat about some of the institutional policies at the University of Minnesota, and then professional guidelines, and then personal integrity. The Code of Conduct. The University of Minnesota has a Code of Conduct. What it does is ask people to commit to the highest ethical standards of conduct and integrity. So why do we have a code of conduct? Well, we have values as members of the University of Minnesota's community. Some of these include our excellence and innovation, especially when it comes to research, diversity of community and ideas, academic freedom, sharing of knowledge. All of these guiding principles are the reasons behind why we have a code of conduct. Who is it for? The Code of Conduct is really for all the members of the University of Minnesota community. In particular, for graduate students, any individual employed by the university using university resources or facilities or receiving funds administered by the university needs to abide by the Code of Conduct. And so this basically includes all graduate students at the University of Minnesota, in addition to members of the faculty and staff, Board of Regents, and other volunteers. So you might know that there's a code of conduct, but how do you carry it out? A lot of these are common sense to most of us, but some of the things listed here are some ways to carry out Minnesota's code of conduct, such as being fair and respectful to others, promoting a culture of compliance, avoiding conflicts of interest. These are ways to carry out the code of conduct. And particularly when it comes to research, there's a specific subsection within the Code of Conduct that talks about teaching and research. All researchers have an ethical obligation to the university and to the larger global community as they seek knowledge, as they seek understanding through doing their research and teaching. You can read these lists of items that are specific expectations for community members when it comes to ethical conduct. There are a lot of examples in academic misconduct that you might see in the news. Here are a few headlines for some recent headlines that showcase differences uh, and examples of academic misconduct. How do we define academic misconduct? Through these bullet points, the fabrication or falsification of data, research procedures, or data analysis, destruction, destructing data, plagiarism, abuse of confidentiality, or other fraudulent actions that really undermine the scholarly process. I encourage you to uh, look at your own professional societies. Many of them have their own code of ethics, and some of those codes of ethics could provide guidance for you as a researcher and as a professional in your discipline. For example, I'm a member of the Society of American Foresters, and we have our own code of ethics. By becoming members of SAF, we really adhere to this code of ethics that's set forth by that organization. Researchers, and especially graduate students, often seek information about these things when it comes to ethics. This includes authorship, plagiarism, data management, intellectual property, and then human and animal subjects. Authorship is in reference to the University of Minnesota's Code of Conduct in one of its subsections. We ask that everyone that adheres to the Code of Conduct fairly assign authorship depending on what's appropriate in your discipline. Authors should include anyone that has conceived, designed, or helped to implement the research, anyone who has done analysis and interpretation, anyone who has prepared the manuscript, done critical editing for the intellectual content, these should be all authors on scientific works that result from research. Plagiarism is specifically called out in the academic misconduct policy. This is really the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. So this is really important to distinguish from honest error in attribution. It's important to distinguish it from sloppy work. 
And it's important to distinguish it from blatant disregard for assigning credit appropriately. Data management has increasingly been a more important thing to consider when it comes to ethical conduct and research. Before collecting your data, or even if you're working with an existing data set, ask yourself, your advisor, your colleagues, who owns the data? Who owns it that was collected as a part of the research? Is the data public? Is it private? Who is responsible for the proper data management procedures? Intellectual property is also another important thing to understand as it relates to ethics and research. The University of Minnesota owns all intellectual property that's created through using university resources and facilities. Whether or not these are supported directly or indirectly by funds administered through the university. So this is an important concept to be aware of, especially for those of you that work in areas of technology commercialization. Now, some of those exceptions to ownership are regular academic works like books, like articles, like course materials, class notes, and even sometimes some software. Some student intellectual property has been created for the sole purpose of satisfying course requirements. And so obviously that paper that a student might write in their course um, is written for that course and is certainly that student's own work. Some of you may be doing research with human subjects, in particular through survey questions, as one example. All of that research requires review by the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, before you initiate your study. And it doesn't matter where the funding comes from, whether it's funded privately or publicly. If it involves human subjects, you need to likely go through an IRB process, especially if it uses records gathered on human subjects or if it involves human tissue. These are really important things to uh, get prior approval from IRB before initiating your study. So what is the IRB? Well, it's composed of members of the university, so including faculty, staff, students, and the scientific community. It's divided into panels, and these panels review the research that's being submitted, uh, and they all have different areas of expertise, from the biomedical to the social behavioral sciences areas. Human subjects training is required for any student that conducts human subjects research. Whether or not you need to actually uh, go through the IRB approval process. Uh, it will be assessed and reviewed by the IRB through this determination form, which initiates the review. Animal subjects. Not many of our students work with animals, but if you do, uh, be thinking about how, uh, how the things apply to your work. Most of these things are specified in the Animal Welfare Act of 1985, and be in touch with your advisor and colleagues about the right ways to go about doing ethically responsible work with animals. You might ask yourself, what if I see research misconduct taking place? There are several ways to do this, to report it. You can meet privately with the Research Integrity Officer at the University of Minnesota. You can meet privately with the administrator from the unit where the incident occurred, uh, or the Faculty Senate Research Committee. All of these issues are kept private and confidential, and the purpose is really to provide advice uh, to the person who's brought up the issue. You could also file a written allegation with the Vice President for Research at the University of Minnesota. This work uh, and this allegation is then reviewed by the Research Integrity Officer. To find out who those people are, you can see more at the Handling Re Reports of Research Misconduct webpage. Finally, while the University of Minnesota and other large organizations have a large number of policies related to responsible conduct of research and academic conduct, I encourage you to ask yourself, what do your values mean and what is your personal integrity when it comes to ethics? Understanding both your own values and the organization you work for can lead to a better and a more prosperous work as you uh, integrate ethics into your everyday work.